it's all about being aligned with the purpose of the company, but also with your purpose, because you also have something that where, you know, you, where you are right now and where you want to take your family in the next three or four years, right? Integrating that has been so amazingly valuable. Today's episode, we're excited to talk to Dr. Maggie Cook. Uh, Maggie grew up among 68 other kids in an orphanage in Mexico. As a child, she taught herself how to play basketball, was selected to play on the Mexican national team. However, she broke a collarbone, missed the opportunity, eventually was able to immigrate to America on a basketball scholarship at the University of Charleston. While there, Maggie started to make fresh salsa for her friends. The word spread. People really liked it. She began to get requests from professors and other staff. Uh, she started to like build a little bit of a business. And after Maggie graduated, while struggling to find a job, make ends meet, she unfortunately became homeless. A friend later entered her in a fresh salsa competition for the state of West Virginia, and Maggie won the contest unanimously, was gifted 800 bucks to start a business, and it was the beginning stages of Maggie's all natural fresh salsas and dips. She learned firsthand the ins and outs, production, distribution, building a talented team, cultivating a positive company culture, driving sales, consumer marketing, along with all types of other lessons that entrepreneurs experience when they start a business up from scratch. In 2015, at the height of the business's success, her company sold uh, to a small company you may have heard of, uh, Campbell Soup, for $231 million. Hi, I mean, that's an M, $231 million. After Maggie sold her company, she shifted her focus toward giving back to the community and does a ton of work locally. Uh, she led a team to help rescue 31 Mexican children from the cartel and sex trade. Uh, she served as the U.S. Program Director of the Give New Life Orphanage, which is where she grew up. Uh, she does a, a ton of public speaking across the globe. And I wanted to talk to her a little bit about resilience. I want to talk to her about culture. I want to talk to her a little bit about what it took for her uh, to stand up a business and what that journey was like. Here's Dr. Maggie Cook. Let's bring it in. Maggie, can we start with a question? I know that you probably don't get rare, you know, you never get this one to maybe start out, but do you mind maybe sharing a little bit about your background and your story um, to open us up? Yes. Um, oh my gosh. There's so much to my story. Um, the best way that people can look at the comprehensive in like three minutes is to go to gomaggie.com, G-O, Maggie with one G.com. The first three minutes of that, it really explains everything about my story. Uh, but just in a nutshell, to give you uh, some perspective here, I was born in an orphanage in Mexico. I have 68 siblings, and my parents adopted 60 kids. There was eight of us that were biological kids. And um, we had it rougher because I heard my father uh, telling my mother that he didn't want the other kids to feel not special because you know, they were adopted, so they would treat us differently. So we got more abuse. We got more stuff that happened to us. That's why we're so, so close. But I I always had a dream to to get out of there because there was so much suffering. We were lived in the mountains of Michoacan, Mexico, which is it's totally secluded from civilization. And I decided to focus on something that was different than what was popular at the time, which was soccer. And I found basketball and I started to play basketball. And I remember seeing Michael Jordan play in one of those little black and white long TVs in, in school and in, in junior high in Mexico. And I asked my principal if I could watch him play every time I could get a chance. And I watched Michael Jordan and that's how I learned my moves. And when I graduated high school, we became national champs and I got recruited to play for the Mexican national team in Mexico City. And I waited for three months for them to call in. But one day I broke my collarbone playing football, American football with my brothers. And my father told me, he was a doctor. He said, your dreams are over. And I was like, ah. But then I knew that I, for some reason I had in my mind that if this happens, something better must be happening or happening to me. And that's the mentality that allowed me to come to America because that summer when I healed, my parents took a bus with all my 68 siblings to tour the United States to raise funds for the nonprofit. And we stopped in West Virginia because I got, they, uh, they invited us to a picnic 
And there was a basketball court there. And the coach of the University of Charleston happened to be there. She saw me play and she told my father, I want her to come play for me on the scholarship. And if I would have believed and listened to my father, who was a doctor, said, do your dreams are over? I may not play that day. And that happened out of, and that's why I'm here today, speaking to you and everybody else. And um, went to college, graduated college, interior design was the only option. I studied architecture in Mexico. So I graduated in West Virginia, couldn't find a job. And then I became homeless, was living out of the street. Then my car blew up and I was literally living in the forest until somebody found me and, and a person from the University of Charleston, she was a cook there and got me a place to stay. Then soon after that, I got entered into a fresh salsa contest because I used to make salsa for my friends. And my friends in college had my teachers like had me bring it to class. And so it was really popular. So I entered this, this salsa contest. I won by unanimous vote. It was a fresh pico de gallo salsa. And back then there was no fresh salsa, almost a tocito salsa. And that was my home moment. I started the Fresh Salsa Company with not knowing anything about business. Google was my main research source. And I grew it from just me and to a team of over 535 people. And in 2015, it sold to Campbell's for $231 million. And that was, it sold with Garden Fresh. And that's really where that journey of salsa making ended and I started my speaking and coaching business. It's an, it's an awesome story. The The thing that jumped out at me was, um, I mean, so much about it, but the, when, when you talk about going from just you to 500 plus people uh, every day and you're really your entrepreneur, first startup, uh, I guess, what can you talk to us a little bit about what that journey was like? Going from, I mean, you were the creator and you had to yeah. teach uh, and coach others around you to follow the same process. What was that experience like for you? Oh my gosh. The biggest thing that I can tell you, which was a turning moment in my business for salsa making was when I got, because I, I got rejected by 90 supermar supermarkets before the Whole Foods market said yes. And I went from making 250 pounds of salsa a week to 10,000 pounds of salsa. That year, we went from $12,000 to $1.9 million in, um, a year, which means that quickly I had to figure out a workforce to make this product. Because the first week I made this product with another person, I'm telling you, we were sore. Our hands, our hands were stuck, you know. So I went to the Small Business Administration and I said, hey, I need 20 people to help me with production for the future because I can't make it by myself with this other person. They said, well, we don't know. You know, we you should talk to the state. They, they're the ones that know everything. So I called the state and I said, hey, I need 20 people. And the next day they said, uh, yeah, we'll have 20 people for you this week. And I said, wow, that's awesome. I've never hired people. So I remember them providing 20 team members and I took them to a room and I rented this room. And when I came into this room, the first thing that I said to them was, Hey guys, my name is Maria Magdalena de la Cruz Garcia. I have an awesome pico de gallo de salsa look and Whole Foods wants it. And I said to them, and I believe that I believe that I believe that we're going to become the largest salsa company in the United States, maybe the world. And you guys are going to help me take it there. And they're like, ah, yeah, they're celebrating. Right. And so I did something there that I didn't realize I did is I brought them to my greater why my purpose. So every day when we would go into production, every time we had a lunch break, I bought them food and we sat outside what I call my conference room in the rocks and in the dirt. And we would always talk about how to improve production. And uh, they were so excited. We, I was always incentivizing them. One time we were meeting and Everybody went in after we had the meeting. This African-American guy stays sitting in the rocks. And I said, are you okay? I go to him. And I said, C can you tell me what's going on? And he says, touches his chest and he says, Maggie, thank you so much for hiring me. Nobody else would hire me. 
I just came out of prison. And I this did this. I did this, this, and that. And I was like, la la la. I don't want to know anything. I said, <laughs> I said, I think you're awesome. Just go back to work. And he went back to work, and I I went outside and I started shaking. And I called the state and I said, hey, you send me a person from prison. And they said, oh yeah, they're all from prison. <laughs> and I was thinking there, sitting there thinking, and I gave them knives, right? But they were the best working people I ever had. Why? Because of one thing. And that was the purpose, the why of coming all together and having that same mission and focus as to what we wanted to achieve collectively. And that, I didn't know I did that, but that really pumped in the, 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 the um, how do you say, the energy behind the prosperity and the success for the company, because as we grew, I continued to do those things. And what became a culture was really a big family. And it was really, really amazing. That's what people care the most about. They didn't care about how much money I paid them. They cared about family and they cared about environment and they cared about growth. Money was the last thing because I know that for a fact because we we created a, a poll and we conducted a poll into the company. You know, the, as I hear you speak about as I hear you speak about that, it's um, I know that in your speaking business today, you're spending a lot of time uh, talking to folks about and corporate audiences around um, you know, how do you leverage your personal strengths uh, to, to to create growth and and you know, it, it feels like today, tell me if I'm wrong, the, you, you, there's study after study after study that comes out talking about how workers feel disengaged, disconnected. It, it really hasn't gotten any better in many, I mean, many ways. It feels like Gallup just kind of keeps coming out with the same, you know, really unfortunate, uh, you know, findings year over year before the pandemic, during the pandemic, after the pandemic. Um what do you find yourself talking to corporate audiences most about when it comes to like, creating an environment like you created, you know, when you had a, you know, a workforce fired up, um, what do you find yourself talking or advising leaders today around how you create a workplace where your feet, people feel not just prepared, but inspired um, and seen um, yes. beyond just like the classification that you are, you know, homeless or the classification that you are, you know, a, a, a convicted felon, or you are all these labels that oftentimes block access to skills. Yes. It all comes and this is maybe hard to, to hear from some CEOs or leadership is that everything as a leader emanates from you. Your culture is a reflection of that leadership. But the one thing that I did that helped me tremendously in growing my culture was I came up with the idea of creating thinking CEOs and I tested it. And I told every one of the people that, that work for me with me, I said, I want you to think of if, if there's any problem that comes up, I want you to, I want us to get into a group, you know, and talk about if you were the CEO of this company, how would you solve this problem? Now, we would not allow them to make any decisions until we collectively decided that it was the right decision to, to make, to, to move forward. And because of that, we ended up saving a ton of money and mistakes. And I incentivized them. And what happened when I incentivized them is that they wanted to find more problems to solve. And so I came to the point where I, I could step away and the company would run itself. Although I didn't want to do that because I wanted to be with them Listen, Sam, I would drop down and do push-ups with them before production. Like, I, I love these guys. And you have to love your culture. You have to really, really care for them to take care of you. When you take care of someone else, they end up taking care of you because they care so much. It's, it's, it's that family environment. And when your company yeah. grows, then you hire people that can do that because it, it, it became tough for me to continue to do that with everybody, right? You break it up into groups, create accountability uh, programs and things like that to just uh, ignite more inspiration behind their work. When when you um, when you think about the next few years to come, you think about the you know what, I mean, there's just throw everything out there that we're hearing. You know, recession potentially in 2024. You're hearing 
AI, chat GPT's effect on work, you're hearing, um, you know, we're starting to see more union movements in a healthy way to try to fight for worker rights and protections. But at the same time, CEOs and executives are, um, you know, costs go up, affects all types of things from shareholder value to bonus structure. I guess what what do you what do you as you're whiteboarding you know all the stuff you're thinking about in 24 and 25 to talk to corporate executives about you know can you give us a peek about what you're thinking about it's a really really good question but it's a question that requires many different answers depending on where each company is sitting and one of the biggest things that I always ask before I even speak is I have meetings with my clients that hire me to speak and I always ask them what is the greatest challenge that you're having? And what do you think your people need to hear? Only then, because every single company is so different. Uh, some things might be affecting them that, that other companies are experiencing that it may not be for them, right? So it's so uniquely different for each. This is why this question is so specific when I'm asking these, these questions to them to be able to come up with a solution in my talk so they can get those takeaways to implement to for their in their culture to make a success of what they're wanting to do for the coming years. Because, you know, we're always facing adversity. There's always going to be recessions. There's always going to be something. But are you equipped correctly to take on those things? And it's all about how you show up. It's all about mindset, too. If you look at the world or the things that are happening in your company with a pessimistic mind, you're going to attract more pessimistic things. But if you approach it with a mentality of openness and inspiration and uh, overcoming adversity, no matter what it is, and you train your people to see things that way, it it's so much easier to deal with those things, no matter what it is, that all those things that you mentioned earlier, no matter what those things are, it's so much easier to deal with those with a different mindset that you see those things in. I, um, I, I recently... Uh in the last few years have worked with an organization in New Jersey called the covenant house. And they have a few um, groups across the country and they advocate to put an end to youth homelessness. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that they do annually, which seems really simple, but is really uh, profound is they do a sleep out and they uh, encourage executives to experience for one night, what that feels like. And, um, you know, when I went to it for the first time, I did it a few years ago, right around the Thanksgiving time period. And, you know, I came out of it with a different understanding and appreciation for the different challenges that workers may consider where they bring to work. You know, we are, we spend so much time thinking about from clock in to clock out, but we don't maybe think about where you go, where you go to, or where you come from when you come to work. Um, you know, your, with your experience and in, in your, your, your lived experience, um, what what do you what do you what do you say or how do you create? If I was an executive asking you, how do I really create a culture of community, which is so much around your work? How do you do that? What are some other ways you can do that? I mentioned Cubhouse was one for me. Um, what are some other ways that corporate leaders can create communities uh, and empathy for you know with their middle leadership and management to understand um, their workforce a little bit better to do the push-ups like you did. How do we get how do we get more people kind of doing push-ups? Yes. So ah, the, the best thing that I can tell that that really ignites me is accountability, creating accountability through through teams. And the way that I do this, and I teach this to to other people too, is creating an accountability system where you bring in people, your your team members, and have and, and teach them how to discover their why and create a an affirmation personal and for their business, for the business, for the, the company that they're part of. And every single day, groups of 10 to 15, they state their why personal and with the company. Just by doing that, you're future casting yourself because the affirmations are in the present moment as that which you want is already here. And then we go through what are the things that you're going to work on today? Well, and if let's say if it's Tuesday, we talk about what did you get done yesterday? Was it successful? Did you not? If not, how can we support you with that? And the passion that comes from that and just the, the people get to know themselves more and they get to know uh, in a personal sense, but also they get to discuss their dreams and aspirations personally, but also as a company. And that to me, 
I found that team members began to manifest things even outside of the company because of their mindset was being aligned to that which they they wanted. And it just, that's a whole different thing to lift up their spirits because somebody manifested, you know, some money here or some money there, or maybe somebody started a, high, a side hustle that I totally support, right? And they got something from that. And it's all about being aligned with the purpose of the company, but also with your purpose, because you also have something that where, you know, you, where you are right now and where you want to take your family in the next three or four years, right? Um, integrating that has been so amazingly valuable. And I know it takes a little bit of time, but 10 to 15 minutes in groups of 10 to 15 and breaking in and creating self-led accountability groups has been mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying is you got to care a lot more than just about the functions and the work specifically that your people, you know, I just said at the, our team the other day, I said, you know, we, we do cliche, but we spend more time together than we do sometimes with our direct family. And I don't know, as a leader, I think that, that, um, that opportunity to do work together requires more responsibility as of leaders. Like you said, you, it's not a nice to have what you just mentioned. Like that's almost how you create a high performing workforce of tomorrow. You have to get into the weeds and help people you mention affirmations. I mean, it sounds so simple. It's not, it's not simple. It's not simple, but it's very powerful. Yes. Love it. Last question for you, Maggie. Um, we're talking about future of work, talking about, uh, you know, a lot of different, uh, I could talk to you for hours on, on a bunch of the other topics, but the, um, the reality is today, you know, the majority of workers in our workforce today, often the ones paid the least pay the most in the way that our structure is set up and folks who bring the most to work um, are oftentimes on the edge and carry a lot of risk. Organizations are trying to grow and trying to fight through, um, you know, the ebbs and flows and choppiness of whatever moment we're in. Like you said, there's always going to be, you know, um, adversity that occurs. Um, I want to ask, what, what is what is your hope for the future of work? I think that my hope is for companies to start seeing people more as family. And really investing their time in getting to know people because people take care of people. Their customers, their clients may take care of their, their, their um, employees, team members take care of their clients, depending on what kind of business it is. And they also take care of the boss and everybody else. So if you're kind to them and go above and beyond to serving them, you have to become a servant leader because leaders inspire action. And the more you do that and lead from the front, I never ask the team member to do something without me showing them how to do it first. And that sense of community and family, it just goes a long way. The more we can integrate that aspect of really truly caring for people, it's not just about money. Because if you give so much value out there to the people that you serve, everything else is gonna come back tenfold. That's something that I've experienced over and over again, and I'm going to continue to do it because it works. It truly works. Maggie, thank you for taking time. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a powerful and wild story, uh, the success that uh, Maggie had as she stood up the business and uh, the work that she continues to do. But I think some of my big takeaways from all around, you know, that that C word, culture, 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 how you do it, how you build it, how you think about it. You know, I think it's really interesting to hear Maggie talk about how culture, if it's positive, uh, is something that, you know, you have to take charge of. I also thought that as a, as a CEO, uh, her perspective that uh, her people, you know, they don't care about the money necessarily, they don't care about, uh, you know, all the other stuff that happens around work, but they uh, do fundamentally care, uh, you know, overwhelmingly about if they're treated as family, if they're in a, in a welcoming environment, if they're invested in, in growth, uh, which was, you know, a big, a big takeaway. You know, Maggie talking about a healthy community. I think we could all take something away from this. It starts with accountability. It starts with encouraging other people in their personal dreams and goals while they're maybe in this moment in time, 
working alongside us in our organization. Maggie said, I found team members begin to manifest things even outside the company because their mindset was being aligned to that which they wanted. Finally, Maggie's hope for the future of work that companies start to see people more as family. So thanks to Dr. Maggie Cook for joining us and having this conversation today. Pretty awesome business, pretty awesome success. Really awesome to see the impact she continues to have in her community. Now, don't forget to subscribe to Bring It In so you never miss an episode. We've got some awesome guests lined up that you're not going to want to miss. Now, back to work.